Hello and thanks for joining us here on France 24 for France in Focus. I'm Tom burgess watson Coming up in the programme, America's oldest ally as the US President Barack Obama heaps praise on his visiting French opposite number, we take a look back at the three-day state visit. And we are a newspaper. Journalists at the left-leaning Libération take their battle to save the struggling daily to their own front pages. And celebrating a landmark, we take a look at the story behind an ancient Egyptian monument in Paris. We begin at the US Embassy in the heart of Paris because this week the French President François Hollande has been paying a state visit to the US, the first by a French president in some two decades. Well, highlighting just how far Franco-American relations have come in the last 10 years, Hollande was given a glittering reception and President Obama heaped praise on him. Let's take a look back now at some of the highlights of this three-day visit. A ceremonial welcome with no details spared for the French president's arrival. Barack Obama made an extra effort, trying out his French for the occasion. Bienvenue, mes amis. A trip to the state of Virginia had Francois Hollande travelling aboard Air Force One. The president's hitting it off before the plane even left the tarmac. On board, the two exchanged pleasantries. First stop, a spot of sightseeing. Stopping off in Monticello, the pair visit the mountaintop home of the third president of the United States, Thomas Jefferson, Francophile and Francophone. What it signifies is the incredible history between the United States and France. We are friends forever. But it wasn't all coming up roses. Pierre Gattaz, head of MEDEF, the Employers Federation, lashed out at Hollande against what he says are unacceptable compromises being forced on French employers under the terms of Hollande's new pact of responsibility. But his comments were already on the back burner by the time Obama met with Hollande for a foreign policy meeting in the Oval Office. And the pomp and grandeur continued on at the state dinner, where the leaders shared the stage, a toast and a joke. You love France. You don't always say so because you're shy, you Americans. But we love the United States. A tent on the South Lawns held hundreds of Washington's invitees for the black tie event, among them top donors and key allies in Congress. Obama and Hollande were front and center as R&B star Mary J. Blige took the stage. The next morning, Alonde left Washington for California's technology hub, Silicon Valley, hoping to sell France as a place to do business. Inspired by what he saw, Pierre Gattaz took a more favorable turn. We, the Employers' Federation, will have quantitative objectives to commit to, and we're working on these objectives. Alonde made light of Gattaz's turnaround. It will even be said that I had the leader of MEDEF applauded. I don't doubt that he will return the favor. It's part of the pact of responsibility, I imagine. The trip ended with a symbolic exchange. And when entrepreneur Carlos Diaz, an outspoken critic against France's high taxes, questioned whether Hollande is capable of embracing French business, he responded with a hug. In a final play at the Charm Offensive, now at its best after three days of practice. Staff here at the newspaper Libération have been venting their fury at plans by the newspaper's owners to try and reverse the fortunes of the struggling centre-left daily. Well, as well as taking strike action, they've also taken their battle to their very own front pages. But Libération is by no means alone in facing tough decisions and declining sales. Shareholders peered into the future of Liberation and imagined it becoming a social network, its offices transformed into a cultural center and café. It was born of proposals to save the ailing paper money and find new streams of revenue. Then, in a front-page editorial last week, no, the staff replied, Liberation is a newspaper. Liberation is a journal fragile. Libération is in a precarious position. It's not backed by a large media group like Le Monde and Le Parisien. 
So we have to adjust when we have even the slightest difficulty. We've had to learn to adapt quickly. The left-leaning paper co-founded by French philosopher Jean-Paul Sartre in 1973 has seen sales plummet for years. 2013 was one of the worst on record. Similar challenges have killed off other newspapers or sent them online. François, once the biggest French daily, selling almost one and a half million copies a day in the 1950s, saw sales collapse and exists now only on the internet. The web has been both a threat to the industry and its potential savior. With fewer customers at the kiosk, Le Monde has developed its website, signing up some 50,000 online customers. You have new generations of readers who are used to getting everything for free. They don't necessarily know your brand or know it as the paper their parents read. So you have to make some things free to attract new customers. And at some point, get them to understand that information has a price. Newspapers have had to shift from a daily format to providing constant news, packaged in new and visually compelling formats for new devices, trying to seduce a new readership, all with limited revenues. Young people think news should be free as though it just exists naturally, but it has to be constructed, manufactured. We should always have to pay for the news because it's the fruit of human labor and the result of journalistic skills. Liberation, the first French newspaper with a website, has tried to shore up revenues in recent years by introducing a paywall for certain stories online. But it may not be enough. Now, if you've tried booking a taxi here in the last few days, you've probably been subjected to a rather longer than usual wait. This is taxi drivers went ahead with industrial action. Well, they're furious at what they see as the growing liberalization of the taxi market, which was until recently very tightly controlled. And they say the growing number of minicabs on the roads of France are stealing their business. Blocking traffic and stranding commuters. These chaotic scenes saw some 55,000 taxis gather at Charles de Gaulle Airport in Paris as part of an almost week-long protest. Convoys splinter off toward the city centre in a bold action against rival minicabs. At the wheel, angry taxi drivers determined to see an end to what they say is unfair competition. I went through six months of training and paid 2,500 euros to drive a taxi. If you pay for training, pass all the tests and then wait between three months and two years for a license, only to find that someone else can just come out of nowhere and do the same job, and all he has to do is pay 70 euros a week, does this sound normal? Costly licenses and heavy regulation are meant to privilege taxis with more freedom to roam. Minicabs, on the other hand, have to be pre-booked and can't pick up passengers who hail them on the street. Pushing for change, taxi drivers say minicabs are flouting the rules and stealing business. It's unfair competition. They don't pay the same tax as we do. Anyone could become a self-employed businessman, dress nicely, buy a beautiful car and solicit clients in airports and train stations. In December, the government fell flat in a bid to even out the playing field ultimately backtracking on a new rule that would see private companies wait 15 minutes between reservation and pickup. In another stab at mediation, Prime Minister Jean-Marc Ayrault has suspended new applications for minicab licenses until the conflict comes to an end. Well, we're now overlooking at the Place de la Concorde in the heart of Paris, which is home to one of the best known landmarks in the French capital. At more than 20 metres tall, the Luxor Obelisk was a gift to France from Egypt's rulers some two centuries ago. And now to celebrate this ancient monument, the Paris Maritime Museum is holding a very special exhibition. At 3,000 years old, the Egyptian monolith is Paris's oldest monument. The 23-metre-high obelisk was sculpted under the reign of King Ramses II. Since 1836, the landmark stood in Paris's Place de la Concorde, a stone throw away from shopping hotspot, the Avenue des Champs-Élysées. Near the banks of the River Nile, the obelisk was once one of two pillars standing at the entrance to the Luxor Temple. Egypt's Viceroy Mohammed Ali gave the monoliths as a gift to France, 
Thus began a seven-year journey. Moving the obelisk intact proved no mean feat. French engineers invented an elaborate system of ropes and pulleys to lay the monument on its side. They were told they could find manpower, but nothing in terms of equipment. No wood, no iron, no tools, so they had to bring it all with them. The French lowered the obelisk onto rows of logs. Workers then took several weeks to drag the stone pillar 400 metres to a specially designed ship. Next came the sea voyage, two years long with a stop in the southern French city of Toulon before the ship set out into the Atlantic, passing via Le Havre and finally up the River Seine to Paris. The obelisk's new home, the Place de la Concorde in the heart of the French capital, the location linked in people's minds with the French Revolution. It was pretty certain that the obelisk would be put in the Place de la Concorde. It allowed them to erase memories of the guillotine. King Louis Philippe chose the site where France's revolutionaries had executed Louis XVI half a century earlier to bring the French together for the obelisk's unveiling. 200,000 Parisians gathered for the event, presented as a day of national celebration. This was the triumph of French technology. France was the first country to transport a 200-ton monolith and set it up on another continent without breaking it. Yet the triumph came with a million-franc price tag. The voyage was so expensive and complicated that today the second obelisk is still in Egypt. Well, with this rather splendid view of the French capital, we leave you for this edition of France in Focus. Thanks for watching and do stay tuned to France 24.